for your attention. Hope you have enjoyed the snacks in our revolving uh, uh, service turntable. Yes, thank you. Um, uh, so the second uh, panel is going to talk about uh, some of the more highly politicized issues related to the Belt and Road. And the first question we want to address is, uh, is China behaving like a neo-colonialist? Is it trying to entrap countries in debt and use other means to maximize leverage? And uh, we're going to start uh, with Barry Sotman, who is a political scientist and lawyer and faculty at HKUSD uh, and has been doing research for many, many years on China's engagement in Africa, but with respect to Belt and Road has uh, been working on Ethiopia, but also uh, been done a project on Sri Lanka, which he's going to talk about. So I'll be speaking uh, in relationship to some controversial issues concerning the Belt and Road Initiative, and my talk will be informed by field work that I did in Ethiopia in 2018 and field work in Sri Lanka in 2019. So I'll first begin by discussing the so-called Chinese debt trap, and I will be discussing it uh, as a discourse, in effect, a global discourse, an idea that has spread uh, largely from the United States to the rest of the world and is extremely commonly found in media. Uh, and the vast majority of people uh, who regularly read media emanating from the United States, but also from some other Western countries, are firmly convinced that there is some sort of Chinese debt trap existing in the world, and of course that is connected with the Belt and Road Initiative. So this is the idea that China lends money to developing countries knowing that they cannot repay the loans and as a condition for making the loans uh, requires that assets be in effect put up as, uh, as guarantees for the loans and in the event that a default occurs, a valuable national asset will then be ceded to China. The usually cited example is one that's already been mentioned earlier here, the Hambantota International Port located at the southern end of the island of Sri Lanka. And this port was built by a Chinese company and it is currently largely under the administration of a Chinese company. Of course, uh, the financing for the project was from China Exit Bank and China Development Bank. So both of the policy banks participated and the companies which have participated in either building or now uh, operating Hambantota International Port are very large state-owned enterprises. But the idea of building the Hambantota International Port was not China's idea at all. In fact, it is very difficult to find any Belt and Road project at least any major infrastructure project that was the idea of China. Almost overwhelmingly, the idea for building this or building that has come from the host country. So that was the case uh, with Hambantota Port. When uh, Sri Lankans decided that they wanted a port uh, in Hambantota, and the idea goes back many decades, uh, they first thought about having it financed and built by Japanese. Uh, they turned to Japan, and Japan at that time was the major lender uh, to Sri Lanka, and Japan didn't want to involve itself in doing any additional financing for that country, which at the time, by the way, was involved in a big civil war. Then they turned to India. And India uh, thought about Hambantota port as a potential rival to ports in India, which is, of course, the major neighboring country. So Hambantota port uh, was built over a period from 2007 to 2012. 
It was then operated by the Sri Lankan Port Authority, a government agency. It was loss making for uh, the entire period of operation by the SLPA from 2012 to 2017. Now when I say that it's loss making, that's not unusual at all. Ports, new ports are typically loss making for many years to come, often for decades. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, a discourse has arisen about Hanban Tota Port with the idea that China was unable to get back the money for uh, financing the port and therefore has acquired the port in a debt for equity swap. None of this is actually true. And all the people that I interviewed in Sri Lanka whether they were the current governor of the central bank, the former governor, people from various think tanks, academics, etc. Not a single one thought that any of this had actually happened, even though it's widely publicized in media. So, uh, Sri Lanka's government was in fact able to make payments on the loans that Sri Lanka took out from China to build Hambanto to port. Actually, those loan payments don't amount to much, about 67 billion U.S. dollars per year, which even for a relatively small country uh, like Sri Lanka is not that much to pay. So the Sri Lankan Port Authority had a very successful, very profitable operation already in Colombo. They have a port there, big container facility. Part of it's operated by a Chinese company, China Merchant Ports, uh, which is a company headquartered uh, in Hong Kong. That port facility makes great profits, and those profits could be used to pay back the loans that were taken out for building Hambang Tota Port. And the Sri Lankan Port Authority had no trouble in doing that. In all, uh, in all the uh, government of Sri Lanka has about 15% of ex its external debt from Chinese sources. And the other 85%, of course, comes from a variety of sources. Most of it comes from commercial loans taken out from banks in Western countries, particularly the US and UK. Uh, but also, of course, loans from other countries, Japan, for example, uh, and then uh, loans from the various uh, multilateral development banks, the IMF, World Bank, etc. So only a small proportion of what Sri Lanka owes in terms of external debt is owed to China. And the difference between the debt owed to China and the debt owed to the commercial banks or the debt owed to sovereign bond buyers in the world, who are 98% of whom are Westerners, is, of course, a difference in the rate of interest. Chinese loans to Sri Lanka have been overwhelmingly concessional, uh, 2 or 3% interest, and a longer period of maturity. That is typically loans from the Chinese government, from the policy banks, uh, will have maturity periods of 20 years, there'll be a five-year grace period, and if Sri Lanka ever wanted to ask for it, more than likely there would be rescheduling, rescheduling and extension. So to repay the mainly non-Chinese debt that Sri Lanka owed, in 2017, Sri Lanka was hard up for cash. It was not because they owed a lot of money to China, because there was hardly any Chinese loans that were coming due then. Actually, only about 3% of what Sri Lanka had to repay then, uh, they had to repay to Chinese sources. The rest was to everybody else. So they decided, not China decided, but the Sri Lankan government decided that it wanted to lease out the Hapato to port. They first turned to Japan again, and Japan said, no thanks, we only want to take leases on ports that will make money for us immediately. Uh, they then turned to India, and India again said, oh, we don't want your port to be in competition to ports that we already have in India, right next door, or that we are building. 
So what happened was that eventually, after a, a lot of very strong negotiations and actual pleas by the Sri Lankan government, a Chinese company, China Merchant Port, stepped forward and agreed to take on Hanban Tota Port, which they probably knew would not be profitable for many years to come, but they have an expectation that it will eventually be profitable. So the lease was a 99-year lease, which sounds outrageous. Uh, but actually, if you look around the world, there are many places where ports have been leased out to foreign companies for 99 years or more. So uh, there was no debt for equity swap attached to any of this. That is, the loan uh, for building Hamban Tota port was not at all canceled. It is still being repaid every year uh, by the treasury of the government of Sri Lanka. And of course, China does not own the Hamban Tota port. Uh, it is leased out, but it is certainly owned uh, by the Sri Lankan government, which makes many rules in connection with how that port can be operated. Well, that's a bit about the Chinese debt trap. And in a paper that I've written about this, uh, actually it's a book manuscript by now, uh, I argue that there in fact is no Chinese debt trap anywhere in the world. So it looks primarily at the Sri Lankan example, but also at several other instances around the world where this claim has been made. Now the claim about a Chinese debt trap is related uh, to the larger discourse about Chinese neocolonialism. Those people who speak about Chinese neocolonialism generally have no idea what neocolonialism involves. And they've done no study of it, and they can't even define it. So they come up with some definition. For example, they will say that China trades industrial goods to developing countries or to the world at large, and it gets back from them various primary products, agricultural goods, minerals, etc. Of course, under this kind of definition of Chinese neocolonialism, then my country, Canada, is a colony of China. Because China ships industrial goods to Canada, Canada ships agricultural goods and minerals uh, to China. Same thing was true with regard to Australia. Well, neocolonialism, of course, does exist in the world, and I'll mention a couple of examples later on. But neocolonialism was first prominently defined in this way, uh, by officials from the West African country of Ghana. And as you can see, it, the definition says that there must be a relationship of dominance and subordination. That is, the neo-colonizing country must, in effect, be ordering around the neo-colonized country. Of course, China was itself a semi colony. Uh, that is, there was an intrusion, of course, by Western countries and Japan. They established their little semi-colonies. Shanghai was actually the biggest part of semi-colonialism uh, uh, in the history of China. And China cannot arguably be said to control the political system of any country in the world. Even those countries where there is a strong Chinese economic presence, nevertheless, as I will talk about in a couple minutes, those countries' governments still enjoy very considerable agency in their negotiations with China. Now, Ethiopia is a model Belt and Road country, uh, and there are many Chinese infrastructure projects, and especially Chinese manufacturing in Ethiopia. And uh, Chinese entities, private or public, uh, run almost half of Ethiopia's industrial parks, which are the centerpiece for the industrialization of Ethiopia. But China does not dominate Ethiopia in any respect. First of all, uh, Chinese companies employ only a small part of Ethiopia's workforce. Uh, most of that debt is, again, highly concessional. The largest loan, uh, as I mentioned in response to uh, some discussion earlier, is $4 billion loan for building the railway from Ethiopia's capital of Addis Ababa to the port in the neighboring country of Djibouti. And that 
loan has been extended to a 30-year repayment period at fairly low rates of interest. At the same time that China has this relationship of infrastructure building from China, manufacturing coming from China, loans coming from China, etc., Ethiopia is closer politically to the United States than it is to China. Uh, the United States has a military presence in Ethiopia, and Ethiopia is currently following prescriptions from the West, particularly from the United States, in terms of privatizing its state-owned enterprises. So, uh, China is not in a position to coerce other countries. In fact, it can be said that in several countries of the world, uh, Chinese are themselves under threat. And I've been in some of those countries in Africa where I've done field work in Chinese communities there. And often, uh, the Chinese are, in fact, uh, an issue within the country, and there's potential or actual persecution. Now, I should mention that neocolonialism, in fact, does exist in the world, and the most prominent examples have involved uh, France in its former colonies in Central and Western Africa, and the United States uh, in some Pacific Island and Caribbean countries. But China doesn't have that kind of relationship. Also, I'd like to say a few words about uh, this question of the agency of countries that are involved in the Belt and Road Initiative, which is closely tied to what I've just said before. Agency is a state's capacity to be able to act independently and negotiate freely with other states. So, of course, the common conception is that countries in the developing world have little agency either because they're poor, they're, their leaders are inept, or they're corrupt, or they're unschooled, or whatever. Uh, but all of the officials that I interviewed in African countries, and I've done field work in about 12 African countries so far, all of them, I've asked about this question, and all of them have asserted very insistently that they have considerable agency in their dealings with China, and even with some more powerful countries than that. Uh, and in recent years, there have been many studies of agency in the relationship between African countries and China. And every one of those studies has come to the conclusion that African countries have had substantial success in negotiating with Chinese entities. The biggest example in this regard has been Angola, a notoriously corrupt country uh, in Southwest Africa. Despite the fact that its official loan has been so thoroughly corrupt, it has nevertheless gotten most of it, what it wanted to get in negotiations with China. So this is not because uh, China is altruistic. It's because China's government basically concurs with the view expressed by a professor at Beijing University, Lian Chang, the leading scholar of China-Africa relations uh, in the Chinese mainland, who said that China needs Africa more than Africa needs China. And the reason for this is, of course, that there are 55 African states, and they all have votes in various international organizations. Additionally, of course, Africa is a big potential market uh, for Chinese goods and services. After all, its population, which is now one-sixth of the world's population, by 2050 will be one-fourth of the world's population. Uh, also, of course, Africa is the treasure house of resources in the world. So China cannot alienate Belt and Road Initiative states through putting undue pressure on them. And it certainly cannot denigrate the people of those states in the manner that someone like Donald Trump has done. So that's uh, my initial presentation. Thanks very much. Uh, next we'll have Nahar Sharif, who's a professor of public policy at HTSD, who's uh, 
been doing research on Pakistan, which is one of the largest recipients of Chinese government investments. Thank you, Albert. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, we're gonna, I'm going to move away from um, topical issues, away from a continent to a specific country. And uh, basically what I'll be trying to understand here is the extent to which China is a friend or a foe of Pakistan um, in terms of its BRI investments. So just to take a step back, whether we believe it or not, I think it's important to have this in mind that at face value at least, the vision and action statement says there's no compulsion for countries to participate in the BRI. Dialogue is to be held on an equal footing, and BRI aims at joint actions to benefit all involved. Whether we are cynical and we say that that's only on paper and it doesn't really happen that way, or the opposite, that it's much better than it's, it's, it's um, stated, that's something that I would like to examine in the case of Pakistan. For our case, uh, my PhD student and myself, we did 75 hours of interviews over 18 months in six cities across Pakistan, and we interviewed academics, business people, um, Chinese managers and workers who are working in Pakistan, um, think tanks, NGOs, and uh, bureaucrats, as well as politicians. So we tried to understand this issue of BRI in Pakistan from a number of perspectives, by interviewing stakeholders at different levels of society, and as I said, about uh, 75 hours of interview. So the first question um, is the extent to which China is, a, is, is exploiting Pakistan. Um, as a group, I must say that there is a, uh, well, let me just stop and step back. There is a sentiment in Pakistan that China, uh, that China is exploiting Pakistan. The, the group of people who espouse this sentiment most noticeably are Pakistani industrialists and business people. They are the group that are most suspicious of CPEC. I use a, um, sorry, I use the acronym CPEC. I switch between the two. CPEC just stands for China Pakistan Economic Corridor, which is a terminology that's used in Pakistan. And maybe it, it might not be surprising why business people in the, and industrialists are the most skeptical. Um, they say that relocated Chinese firms into Pakistan will have more efficient manufacturing capabilities, leading to cost advantages. They can manufacture much better than we can. They can much manufacture much more cheaply than the Pakistanis can. And therefore, the Chinese companies will have a distinct advantage as compared to the Pakistani companies. And you can imagine why. They are the um, um, companies that are in Pakistan now. They are the ones who are conducting and reaping the benefits of all the business that is conducted in Pakistan. Obviously they will be hesitant when um, another player comes in and tries to challenge their incumbent status. So that's one group of um, stakeholders who are definitely suspicious of the Belt and Road in Pakistan. Um, away from a group of people is, is an argument that we often find in, in um, the media, uh, by, in the local media as well as um, Western media, that Pakistan is being burdened by debt obligations. And uh, my previous um, my colleague, the previous speaker, termed it the Chinese debt trap, CDT, right? He called it the Chinese debt trap. The IMF estimates, uh, the IMF estimates show that as of March 2019, Pakistan's debt, debt obligations to China stood at 22 billion, and Pakistan will need to pay 4.5 billion annually to China from 2024 onwards. However, bureaucrats in Pakistan, and they've shown us the calculations, have shown that such outflows can be absorbed without much stress on the balance of payments, provided a certain number of conditions are met. That Pakistan ensures that exports grow at least 10% per annum, which they have been over the last three years. Export revenues in 2024 are expected to rise to 40 billion. And also there will be savings from reduced oil imports because of the uh, infrastructure into energy projects, uh, the investments into infrastructure um, pertaining to energy projects that have taken place, and also savings from the losses caused by outages. So prior to China's involvement in Pakistan, energy was a big issue. There was, there was insufficient energy. Now with uh, China's involvement in Pakistan, they've developed um, many uh, coal-powered um, electricity plants. Some are uh, hydro plants. And this has relieved the shortage of energy dramatically. There's another argument that says there's a lack of transparency over our Belt and Road projects. There's a lack of transparency. We don't know what's going on. In fact, the current government, who is now a ruling Pakistan, the, it's called the PTI party, um, one of their 
one of their slogans as they rose to power was that once we are in uh, the ruling um, elite, we are going to expose the deals that were made between the previous uh, political parties um, in Pakistan and China. Now, they have not revealed those deals. It's a very sensitive issue. Um, I, I, I cannot say with certainty whether it's the Chinese who asked for this lack of transparency or whether it was the Pakistanis. It's, it's very difficult to tell because I feel that these answers are muddled by which side of the political spectrum are the individuals who I'm talking to. However, um, what we do know for a fact is that non-Pakistani banking channels were used for the payment of import of some of Chinese, some of the machinery that Chinese companies imported. It was not visible on import financing data um, issued or released by the State Bank of Pakistan, which raised suspicion. So these are some of the arguments where people um, espouse when they say that China is exploiting, Pakistan is being exploited by, by China. However, there's another side of the coin, and, and that's the other side that I'd like to present now before concluding, that China is perhaps a friend. It is not a foe, it is, it is help in Pakistan. And, and for that, one of the, one of the um, key points that we found in our interviews was that a lot of people harked back to 2013. 2013 was not too long ago, six, seven, uh, six years ago. After 9-11, Pakistan remained one of the worst countries in terms of terrorism. Since 2001, more than 60,000 civilians have been killed through war against terrorists. India's Narendra Modi just term, um, labeled Pakistan the epicenter. And Pakistani society and economy suffered immensely. Between 2002 and 2013, the average annual FDI into Pakistan was only 2.3 billion per year. The Belt and Road Initiative in Pakistan is expected to be roughly 60 billion. So, what I'm trying to say here is that when the Belt and Road Initiative started in Pakistan, many people remember very clearly, Pakistan was a pariah. Pakistan was a leper in the international community. No one wanted to come close to Pakistan for whatever reason. And China did. China put out its hand and it says, we're going to come in with 60 billion. At that time, it was, it was um, announced to be 50 billion, and afterwards, it was raised to 60 billion. This against the backdrop where you had FDI amounting to merely 2.3 billion annually from the period 20, 2002 to 2013. And now when China did that, investor confidence was raised, industrial cooperation, special economic zones, and the port began developing. So um, special economic zones are still currently under development. The port has been developed. Um, Pakistani students are given scholarships for higher education degrees in China as part of people to people exchange. And in Pakistan as well, technical and vocational training schools have increased by a, a large amount over the period 2013 to 2019. And they've been established for Pakistanis to uplift their skill levels of its labor force. Meaning that there has been a signaling effect of the Belt and Road Initiative. Investor confidence was raised, local confidence was raised, and there are estimates from the Chinese embassy and from, I know we're in EY, but another consulting, <laughs> relatively famous consulting agency, estimated 700,000 direct jobs, whereas the Chinese embassy, 70,000, for different periods of time. So I just put that as a friend. On balance, what would I say, um, based on the research that I did over the last 18 months, I would fall more towards the side of China as a friend. It, it, particularly, in Pakistan's context, we cannot simply evaluate BRI on today's terms. We have to look back and see where Pakistan was in 2013. And it's a general consensus that in 2013, Pakistan was at the lowest point economically, socially, politically, that it has ever been in its recent history. So with that in mind, a country stepping in, for whatever reason, was something that was what well, Pakistan was very grateful for. The historical picture must, must be included in our evaluation and now things may have changed, and I do think they have changed, particularly the speed and intensity has slowed down. With this new administration, they've had to um, obtain loans, stopgap loans from the IMF, which imposed many restrictions on what they can do and what they cannot do. They've had to um, put their hand out and get stopgap funding from the United Arab Emirates, from Qatar, and also from China. So the speed and intensity with which they are now approaching Belt and Road Projects has definitely slowed down, um, and this is a reflection of the priorities of the new government, for better or for worse. However, the BRI has not stopped. The Belt and Road Initiative in Pakistan has not been halted. It still exists. Maybe the pace has slowed down, 
the direction in which it is going is, is uh, slightly different from what it was originally envisioned as, but it's still there. And if we keep the holistic picture in mind over a five or six year period, um, our, our conclusion, my conclusion is that China has been more of a friend than a foe. I'm not saying that China does not benefit in any way, shape, manner, or form. Well, obviously it does, it's a business um, exercise. However, from Pakistan's perspective, the intervention that they did in the time that they did was extremely beneficial and the fruits of which they are still reaping today in Pakistan. Thank you. Uh, so the last speaker on the second panel is um, Angela Pico, who's going to talk about um, some of her work in South Asia. Thank you, and thank you all for coming and for staying with us until uh, this uh, very late afternoon. So I'm going to talk about three countries in Southeast Asia on which I did uh, field research. And these countries are Indonesia, Malaysia, and Myanmar. So I'm going to ask this, uh, uh, I'm going to answer this very provocative question, just with some basic uh, common sense, which, uh, however, is not very common these days, I find. So the first point is, so let's start from Indonesia, which is uh, the most exciting country, I think. It's the largest economy in Southeast Asia, and uh, its relations with China haven't always been great. But President Widodo, which was re-elected this year, is very positive about its engagement with China and also with the Belt and Road. He actually launched his own initiative, the Global Maritime uh, Fulcrum, which is very similar to China's Maritime Silk Road. So these two initiatives very much align. And uh, as you can see from the graph on the uh, uh, right hand side, uh, while Indonesia is opening up to Chinese investments, uh, which are bringing not only new capital, but also new technologies to the country, uh, the in infrastructure spending is going up, but still the debt that is owed to China remains very limited. Uh, the China part is the red one, uh, so you can see that most of the debt is actually owed to Singapore or to Japan. So next we move into Malaysia, which is really a case that shows how the Belt and Road can really become a political tool for, for local leaders. Malaysia changed government last May, um, and initially Mahathir, which is the current Prime Minister, uh, criticized many Chinese investments uh, that were made by his, his predecessor, Najib, uh, Najib Razak. Um, some of these projects are allegedly also connected to the 1MTB graph scandal uh, and were later cancelled or renegotiated. But after these renegotiations, uh, Malaysia became again very supportive of China's Belt and Road. Um, and at the moment, investments in the countries are really rising again. Then the last case is Myanmar, which really shows the picture of one of the least developed countries in Southeast Asia. Its economy only started to open in 2012, and in 2016 the humanitarian crisis in Rakhine State broke out. And this really took uh, a lot of efforts from the government. Uh, it diverted the efforts to peace negotiations and to dealing with this problem, and it also prevented a lot of foreign investment going into the country. Um, as you can see, Myanmar's foreign debt is rising, uh, but it's still well below 50% of its GDP. Um, it's supposed to peak, but actually one of the things that uh, not many people mentioned is that this debt was just, is not acquired like last year or like in the past few years. Actually, if you look at it, uh, most, more than 50% of it is very old debt. Uh, that was acquired by the previous government in um, around 1988. So it's almost 30 years old. Uh, finally, uh, one more point that I wanted to make on the sec second part of the question that talks more about resources. So it's China Belt and Road, a resource seeking initiative. Um, I, answer, I want to answer this question with uh, the data from, uh, from our own database. And uh, I basically extracted the main resource-related uh, sectors and compared investments before and after the Belt and Road. And as you can see, um, actually investments to extract resources have actually declined after the launch of the Belt and Road. 
And they have moved into what many people call capacity exporting, which is basically building energy projects and building like smelter plants um, and so on. Um, so this is the first part of my um, talk. Thank you. So, do any people have questions off the bat? Do we have any reactions from the other panelists to each other's presentations? I don't know if, uh, if there's anyone at universities looking at this from the uh, international relations perspective. It seems to me we could have a much more interesting understanding of the dynamics of this situation between the U.S. and China, if there was an overlay of the, the role that the United States is playing in all of this. And it, it, with respect to Pakistan, for instance, and Malaysia and other countries, the United States is not a a passive observer. I mean, it's actively involved. And uh, we certainly see that in South Korea as well. Uh, but so, uh, if someone could give their views on what the United States is doing, what the local countries are doing to, in response, and how, in turn, China is responding, if at all. Thank you. Okay. Well, I think the United States is playing a very active role in the Belt and Road Initiative, in opposing it, of course. That is, in every respect, everywhere, the United States opposes the BRI. And it does so in, through a variety of mechanisms. One mechanism is simply to tell countries that if they involve themselves in the BRI, they will end up in the Chinese debt trap. And it's not for nothing that the main source of the discourse about the Chinese debt trap emanates from the United States and from the very highest levels of political power in the United States. So the United States, in effect, has a counter-mobilization against the mobilization that constitutes the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, in a class that I, a course that I teach at uh, HKUST this semester on the Belt and Road Initiative, one thing that we started out doing was to try to characterize the BRI. And one line of argument is that the BRI amounts to a kind of campaigning or mobilization. China is, of course, a country where there have been many mobilizations, many campaigns. Uh, large sections of society are mobilized to give support. The United States is doing the exact opposite, the mirror opposite, in every possible forum. That is to say that uh, the Belt and Road Initiative, first of all, should be opposed on this or that ground. And then second of all, uh, it is something that is not worthwhile, uh, that it will not be sustainable. And we'll be dealing with the question of sustainability in a few minutes. So uh, if one looks at the BRI in terms of international relations theory, of course, realists, people uh, who think in, in that kind of terms about international relations are probably going to try to fit the BRI into a contest between uh, China as a rising power and the United States as being the global hegemon and trying to protect itself from uh, the rising power. That's just one way of looking at it. Of course, there are several important theories in international relations, and lots of those theories are themselves now being marshaled by scholars uh, to try to explain uh, both the Belt and Road Initiative itself and the active presence of the United States in terms of opposing it. Uh, so about my cases, I, I just wanted to share that um, recently we had a talk at USC uh, from a very senior academic from Singapore and then he said something that was uh, really interesting. So at some point every country is going to pick sides um, and it is very extreme but at some point they have to and 
when you talk to politicians in this country, they, they often think of this trade war uh, because it is a possibility that America will retaliate uh, if they see too many investments going somewhere. And, and also like one of the main uh, questions that Chinese companies in the manufacturing especially going out, they are asking is uh, about the certificate of origin. Uh, so like how much of the manufacturing, how much of the production line we can move to really say that this product comes from, uh, from this country. And another point is also about Japan, uh, which uh, it's really like the main competitor in uh, Southeast Asia. And it has like a very long term, uh, you know, relations with all of these countries. And you can see that some countries are even exploiting this rivalry uh, to get better deals. And, and you see this clearly in the high-speed rail between Jakarta and Bandung, where one of the Indonesian politicians says, let them race for building this railroad in, uh, in Indonesia. It's good for our country. We will get you know, some benefits from it. So it's, uh, yeah, it's quite interesting. Thank you. I'd like to ask a question to Barry. Um, in the Western media, there was a lot of debate about uh, the Hamad Delta port, and uh, actually, like uh, uh, some of them described it as a risk for nation for the national security of uh, Sri Lanka after the concession agreement. Is there something that you'd like to share with us on these aspects? Yeah, this is a point that I didn't have time to cover, and that is that. Uh, at the time that Hamban Toto Port was leased out in 2017 to a Chinese company, of course there were concerns expressed by uh, a couple prominent countries, certainly the United States and certainly India. Uh, but the response of the Sri Lankan government, which by the way is a highly neoliberalist government, uh, whose prime minister is very close to the United States politically, uh, his response was that we entirely control the uh, security of Hamban Tota Port. That is, it cannot, by the port agreement itself, uh, the lease agreement, it cannot be used for any military purpose. And to guarantee that that doesn't happen, we will move the headquarters of our Navy to Hamban Tota. So they moved uh, all these Sri Lankan naval ships and uh, sailors right next to the Hamban Jota port. And of course, they did so to reassure India, particularly, that China would not turn Hamban Jota port into a military installation. Now, of course, this port continues to lose money. The estimate on the part of China Merchants Port that's now, in effect, the main operator, is that it will continue to lose money for six to eight years to come. And it may, of course, be an uh, underestimate. It may take even longer than that. So it's hardly an uh, economic threat in that regard. Uh, until it's able to do more business, uh, it will be, in effect, a burden on the company and a burden on China, because this is a central government-owned uh, company. So the issue has certainly been raised. It continues to be raised constantly in the discourse, and the assumption is made that because a Chinese state-owned enterprise runs the port, it will be turned into a military uh, asset. But there doesn't seem to be any indication that China wants to do that. And there's certainly no indication that either the Sri Lankan government, and especially the Indian government, whose air force is only a couple hundred kilometers away from Hamban Tota, would allow anything like that to happen. It's about the trade wall and the and and, and the, the Belt and the Road Initiative. Uh, for example, that the recent of the trade wall really increased the tariff on Chinese manufacturings, and some of them um, shipped a bear of the factories to the Southeast uh, Asian uh, Southeast Asian countries. So I'm wondering that whether the trade wall somewhat and uh, speed up those of the process of the trade Belt and the Road Initiatives. Well, this is actually a question uh, not just for me, but also for Angela, in the sense that there's no doubt that there is greater interest on the part of at least Chinese manufacturers 
uh, to shift part of their operations to other countries. Now, she could probably say something about Vietnam, for example, in that regard, or, or <laughs> Dini can say something because she's done field work in Vietnam. But uh, I, my guess is it probably affects also Indonesia, Malaysia, and some other countries in Southeast Asia. Certainly, it's had an effect in East Africa uh, because you may know that there has been a discourse in Chinese circles for some years about how China should relocate part of its manufacturing to Africa, and particularly to East Africa, and especially to Ethiopia. That's the reason why, as I noted, there are so many Chinese companies now involved in industrial parks in East Africa, and again, especially in Ethiopia. So since the beginning of the trade war, uh, people like Li Fu, uh, Justin Lin, who uh, was the chief economist of the World Bank, and uh, my former colleague at HKUST, uh, he uh, has long advocated this migration of Chinese companies uh, to Africa, particularly. And needless to say, he feels wholly vindicated now, and that he's getting the, the better of the argument in, in saying that Chinese companies, under the current circumstances, would be well advised to uh, move some of their plants uh, to Africa. Uh, of course, they're going to do so uh, for their, their own benefit. And uh, if they do do so, they would only do so because they're actually rather brave. Because they may have to pay a higher tariff if they're still manufacturing in China when they export to, say, the United States. But uh, conditions in Africa still are difficult. There's no doubt that there are lots of obstacles in terms of infrastructure and logistics, etc. So some of them will do it, although it won't be the avalanche that the Nipu hopes for. Uh, I can say something that on the, from the perspective of these host countries. There is actually a lot of restructuring of these uh, regulations to make the investment environment more efficient and be able to attract more Chinese investments, especially in the manufacturing sector. So some countries have uh, you know, instituted more like an uh, online platform to be able to obtain business licenses in a much shorter term. Um, and actually, like, uh, like Professor Park said, the question of governance is very important and the Chinese investments in the manufacturing are actually going to better countries. So they're going to Indonesia and Malaysia, but not so much to Myanmar. Even though the labor cost is cheaper, uh, they prefer uh, places where the overall infrastructure and protection for investors is better. Uh, other question, question in the back here. So I would have a so quick question for Professor Salman and for Professor Sharif. Um, so, Professor Salkin, I'm wondering if you have any familiarity with the competition between the United States and China in Djibouti and how that is playing out because that would be an interesting illustration of this great power competition affecting local politics potentially. And then, Professor Sharif, I'm wondering about the potential interest on the part of China to develop a naval port near Guadar and if you have any insights into how that's developing. Well, for Djibouti, uh, Djibouti is a place uh, which is mostly desert, very small population. The territory itself is small. Uh, it has two industries. One industry is the port, and that port receives tremendous amounts of goods from Ethiopia, both coming and going. And then also for, from other countries in the region, at least in terms of imports. So that's one of Djibouti's industries. Uh, the other industry is leasing out its territory to the militaries of the world. So uh, the United States has for some time had Camp Le Monnier, uh, an old French Foreign Legion camp uh, in Djibouti. It has four to 5,000 uh, US soldiers, mostly Marines. These are combat-ready people and deployed uh, from there to various places. Uh, in addition, uh, there are military bases established by Japan, by Italy, uh, I think Saudi Arabia, yes, also has one. And of course the rents on those 
bases are considerable, and Djibouti makes some money that way. Now, in terms of the Belt and Road, uh, Djibouti's position has been that it is being immensely helped by China in terms of the development of infrastructure. Chinese were involved in building the port, and they are extending the port further right now. Construction is ongoing. China merchants, again, a company that I mentioned several times is involved in that. Uh, in addition, Djibouti is the endpoint to the Addis Djibouti Railway, which I mentioned. So uh, Djibouti uh, has been given a hard time about accumulating so much debt to China. Actually, proportionately, it is the country of the world with the highest percentage of its external debt owed to China. And the J Djibouti foreign minister, every time he's interviewed by some Western correspondent, uh, is asked this question, how can you get yourself so in hock to China? And his answer always is that, well, we tried other places, they won't lend us any money. And uh, China lends us money at, at very low rates of interest, with repayment periods over a long period of time. So we turned naturally to the French, our former colonial power. But France has no money, and France has no willingness to help people like us out. The United States, of course, is mostly concerned about the Chinese military presence in Djibouti. And the, the two bases, the Chinese base and the US base, are close to each other. So naturally, there's the, the thought that somehow or another, the United States will be disadvantaged by the Chinese military base. So far, Chinese military base hasn't been used for anything except logistics purposes. Uh, whereas the U.S. military base, like U.S. military bases all over the world, is pretty active in terms of fulfilling a full-scale military role. Yeah, so just briefly on the issue of um, China perhaps in the future developing a, a naval base in Guada. Um, this goes back to the issue of um, construction of narrative that my um, colleague talked about. I have heard, I have read, obviously, about this idea, but in my interviews with, I, we, I went to Guada, I, I interviewed the, the managers of the port, um, there was no sense that this is on the horizon. They were very much, this is what we're doing now, this is all that we know about. And they, too, have heard of these rumors, mostly from international media, which the local media then pick up and then they, they, they report. But there's no evidence yet, at least. Maybe this is um, on China's, uh, on the agenda for China, that this is something they want to do, and, and people are extrapolating and taking that forward and running with it. But at least as far as Pakistan is concerned, we could not find any evidence that phase two of water is going to be a military base. And you know, in, in the international media, there's this whole argument, string of pearls, stretching from water down to Sri Lanka and then Southeast Asia and so forth and, and Guada is one of those string of pearls in, on which they can make this military base. But I must say the evidence that we found for this was very scant. When we talked to people and we asked them about this, they repeated what they had heard in international media, which was nothing new. Uh, question. Yeah, uh, So let's move on to the final question uh, for the second panel. And this is about the issue of sustainability. And I'm going to ask Angela this time to kick off and uh, give some remarks. Thank you. So to answer this question, I would like to give you a, a quick preview of one of my upcoming studies. See, I divide the Chinese investments into four main categories. Uh, green, which is uh, renewable energy and environmental technologies, black, which is uh, coal power plants, mining, and oil and gas, gray, which I divided from black, and you will see why, uh, which mainly includes minerals and metal, uh, metal manufacturing, and also digital, which includes all these new high-tech investments from China. And uh, about digital, if you are interested to know more about the digital Silk Road, you can ask Yujia, who is uh, here in the audience, and she's really our guru of uh, the new, these new technologies. So here are the results, quickly. Uh, that basically, first of all, you can see that there is a very big difference in the variety of these results. 
Um, if you look at Indonesia, you see how much more investments overall uh, they have been able to attract. And this is really a result of the agency of the Indonesian government to really attract a lot of Chinese investments into mostly uh, smelter plants to use the nickel resources in Indonesia and restructure the, um, the exports from raw commodities into more value-added exports. And then there is a bit of the black part that I'm going to zoom in in a while, which is mostly coal power plants, which is also about using the large reserves of coal to make uh, coal power plants to add to the electricity to the grid of the country. Then in Malaysia, you see that there is mostly green technologies that are coming up after the Belt and Road. And this is really a result of the incentives that the Malaysian government has been giving to uh, companies. And the interesting part about these uh, green investments is that they are mostly made by uh, private companies. And finally, Myanmar has, more, has mostly attracted uh, investments in uh, oil and gas. So here is just, um, I wanted to give you a bit of an overview of one of my studies that I did that looks at coal power plants in Indonesia that are made by Chinese companies. And you can see that unfortunately, after the Belt and Road, uh, 17 new deals were made to build coal power plants. And these deals were made by both uh, state-owned and private companies. If you look at the financing of coal power plants, you see that these 17 deals were actually uh, negotiated in only three years, uh, between 2013 and 2015, and then they suddenly dropped. So this can be a result of the... And uh, one more important point is that uh, when you look at coal power plants in Indonesia, why have so many investments uh, been happening? Uh, because these are also at Indonesia's request. So not only China wants to export its capacity to build coal power plants, but also Indonesia wants to attract investments in coal. Um, and why? Actually, a lot of NGO reports that have been coming up in very recently, like last year, they have exposed not only the environmental degradation, and these are some of the pictures that I took uh, during my field work, but also the strong level of rent seeking in uh, the mineral sector, in coal, and also in minerals in, in Indonesia. So overall, like, uh, it's also like a, a learning lesson for Chinese companies to, I think that some of these deals have, have, not, um, have not happened yet. They've just been negotiated, and it can be that um, all these 17 new power plants may be turned into other type of plants. Uh, and also, you know, the level of uh, land seeking from local politicians will eventually uh, be dealt by the, local by the local government. So overall, the outlook is still quite positive towards the change, but this will require both the host country states commitment and the, the commitment by Chinese companies. Thank you. Um, sustainability wasn't um, a focal point of my research, but um, over the course of my general research, there are 15 projects that are prioritized in Pakistan, energy projects, and they are generating currently 11,100 megawatts of electricity. 75% of the electricity generated through coal power plants. Of that 75%, half import coal from China, and half get the coal from within Pakistan. Those are the findings that I found. There, there are hydro plants and solar power plants, but they are very small in nature, and there are some wind power plants as well, but they are extremely small, almost experimental. And when we did our investigation to try and find out whose initiative, uh, based on whose initiative were these plants um, developed, it was almost predominantly on the side of Pakistan, policymakers saying, that coal power plants are the cheapest. We have coal here. Even if we buy from China, it's cheaper than the infrastructure involved in making um, hydro and solar and wind power plants, which is the reason why the hydro, wind, and solar power plants are so small scale in nature. So that's 
So those are my uh, passing remarks. Well, I'll just mention something that is going on, I think starting today, um, in New York. Uh, the United Nations Secretary General has called a special conference about climate change focused upon the question of coal-powered plants. And uh, interestingly, uh, the Secretary General decided that some countries would be barred from attending they would be punished, in effect. Uh, and other countries would be told that they must do much better, but they can come and discuss how coal power plants can be sharply diminished in the world in coming years. So it's interesting to see which countries were barred. Uh, the most prominent country barred was obviously the United States, since the US is withdrawn from the climate change pact. Uh, but uh, Japan was barred because Japan has been a very significant builder of coal power plants and continues to take on many new projects in that regard. And South Africa also has been involved in many uh, coal power plants and taking on new projects. Now interestingly, the two biggest countries in the world in regard to, with a history of building coal power plants have been China and India. So obviously these are extremely important countries in the, the macro sense, and they haven't been barred. And they haven't been barred, I think, because both of those countries have shown some evidence of paying some more attention to at least the possibility of moving away from building coal power plants, not only within their own countries, but abroad as well. And in Africa, for example, you can see two, con two contrasting uh, aspects of this. On the one hand, recently, uh, the proposed building of a coal power plant in Lamu in Kenya was negated, in effect. That is, that project is being called off. And China was involved, of course, in that effort, just as they're involved in uh, trying to construct a new port in Lamu. Um, so that was, in effect, a defeat from China, which, for China, which is the way it was depicted in the international media. But it was certainly a victory in terms of fighting against climate change. On the other hand, uh, when I was in Kenya, uh, there I, I also saw that in the northwest corner of Kenya, Africa's biggest wind farm was being built, and that wind farm, farm was uh, built by Chinese as well. So uh, that all that indicates, I think, that we are perhaps uh, at a kind of tipping point with regard to China's approach uh, to these questions of environmental sustainability, and particularly with regard to what kind of energy sources they supply. Uh, apart from that, I'd just like to mention really briefly uh, that sustainability, of course, refers to not just environmentally related questions, but of course, when we talk about sustainable development, there are lots of other aspects. And one part of the discourse about the Belt and Road Initiative has been about the supposed unsustainability of many Belt and Road projects. That is, that they're not economically viable projects, that they are so-called white elephants. And, uh, well, there's been over 3,000 Belt and Road infrastructure projects. Usually about two or three are the ones that make it into the media discussions. And Kambato de Pork, which I mentioned, of course, has been the most prominent example. The fact that it's not yet making money uh, is, it is said to underlie the fact that it is and will be a white elephant. But I, I did research at Kambato de Pork. I stood on the shore of the Indian Ocean. Uh, if you look out uh, onto the Indian Ocean from Hamba and Tota, at any given time you will see six very large oil tankers passing within 10 kilometers of the shore. So, uh, is it a white elephant? Uh, not by the definition uh, that scholars who study white elephant projects have come up with. It's merely something that's going to take a while to get going. Uh, will it be sustainable? That depends upon how uh, clever, perhaps, the company is in attracting business away from 
uh, the ports that currently would serve such large oil tankers. Why don't we call it a day? And thank you for coming to our uh, presentation this afternoon about taking stock of the